Okay, welcome back then, early June 1855, and we're going to run through a few turns here, uh, I think, to kind of get an idea of the opening, sort of um, opening moves, really. Um, so Omar Pasha is heading back to Adrianople, slowed by some rather difficult weather, which would have turned the ground, of course, into quagmire. Um, Admiral Kareem Nadir has made surprisingly good, um, good kind of distance so far. Um, he's in Sinop, and he is... 37 days away. We, uh, we again we've set him to force march. We're hoping that's going to kind of uh, pay off. Uh, this time around he has a 75% chance of force marching, and we've got an 85% chance for Omar, which would increase the kind of speed of getting these guys into place. Um, the opening moves for the Austrians then is using very small forces, not the very large kind of army commands that you might expect. Using kind of um, brigade-sized forces, they've moved in and taken. Um, Sarajevo, Bosnia, uh, really, uh, you know, sort of um, unopposed up to this point, which is what we expected would be the case. Uh, there's a good chance then they might send these smaller forces through the Zvornik Gap into the Balkans. These are very small forces. They're just going to be kind of scouting forces, reconnaissance, really. We've taken our cavalry brigades out of the fortresses of both Sofia and Salonika, um, and we're going to keep these guys in place just outside the fortresses. They are set to kind of retreat if engaged, and... Um, they're just going to, again, function as a kind of reconnaissance on the ground. Hus um, Hussein Avni then is um, set to try and clear up the kind of Greek revolt in Rhodes um, over the next fortnight. And hopefully that will be done and we can get him back up north. We're going to get him back into Adrianople. Probably going to give him command because he's a three-star general now of Abdul Karim Nadir's force. Abdul Karim Nadir is going to be slotted in to take command of what is currently... The strategic reserve being built up, which is Ritsa Pasha's force, which is these kind of service asset units, artillery and supply. But of course, they are very soon going to be joined by Osman Pasha, who is, I think, near the Canaries Islands at the moment. He's kind of his, his um, army corps is um, sailing back from Venezuela. And also, it's going to be joined by um, an additional army corps that's being kind of trained and constructed, fabricated. Um, in Smyrna, we've got an infantry division in Palestine, which we're going to bring back. That's going to be joined by another infantry division under the command of Ritza, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Ismail Pasha, uh, currently in Aden. Uh, we've detached his force uh, and the commander also from Zarif Pasha's commander. We've put Zarif Pasha in a fort in Aden for the time being, it's struggling with supply issues. Uh, we do have a harbour there, we do have a depot, we're hoping that's going to be enough. Um, to resolve those supply issues um, in fairly short order. Uh, that's pretty much it. We're probably going to build an additional cavalry division uh, also to slot that into what will become Abdul Karim Nadir's command. So it'll be a two army corps, two divisions, a cavalry division, some service assets and some artillery. And that should be about 60 to, like 60 to 70,000 men. That's probably kind of good enough for what would be a, a third field command, if you like, in the European theatre. So again, just moving our kind of pieces into play at the moment. Um, there's not much else to report on the military front. Uh, we continued engaging rebels outside Saranaika, inflicted another 2,000 casualties out of 4,500, only losing 400 ourselves this turn. We're going to keep the pressure up, I think, and look to kind of finish the job and to clear this area entirely um, of rebel forces. Uh, looking at the surrounding areas, military control seems to be fairly tight. There's no reports of any other kind of insurgencies or rebellions. Um, so that seems to be okay. We're going to have to sort of... Uh, you know, back on the back on the sort of back foot, really, um, in your men for the time being. We do still have forces in theatre, and we still have a three-star general. Um, we'll keep him. We'll keep him there for the time being. I think. We want to get these forces kind of organised back up to scratch, and uh, only on that basis will he be able to secure. Really, we're going to try and keep a line open from Aden to Sana. That's the, the in the broadest possible sense the plan. I think. Um, your many forces have broken off and moved into the east of the country now, in Hadramut and Lukala. Uh, of course, they're, they're unlikely to stay there. We've sent some colonial merchants with a view of building a trade post, although a bit foolhardy. We have got quite a lot of time to play with with regard to developing that trade post, but we don't have any muscle on the ground really to kind of ensure that economic development isn't just instantly thrown away. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, yeah, that's it really. Um, all quite on the east. We can, again, still see Russian forces. Need to keep that in mind. You know, uh, there's another uh, Russian command. Um, yeah, uh, in sort of Poti, the Poti kind of region. Um, so, you know, what that means, we don't know. That'll become clear, I suppose, uh, in time. But, yeah, we need to go for maximum force concentration and try and kind of, um, yeah, see if we can secure an earlier piece as possible against Austria, uh, just by giving them a bit of a bloody nose um, before they become kind of too committed. The fact that they don't have large forces here suggests they might have 
a lot of large forces concentrated in northern Italy, um, or perhaps they just haven't brought their forces into play yet. Perhaps it's just the case that they, you know, they may have themselves have anticipated a quick occupation of Bosnia, and then following from that, a kind of peace request from us or something uh, remains to be seen. But that's it for now. Economic administration has kind of been done. I've increased this strategic reserve also, I should say, um, somewhat. And I've also um, uh, enlarged the maritime reserve. We did have some damaged ships. We're still kind of very much at the end of Age of Sail, but in the Age of Sail, where ships are made of timber, and even if they have kind of um, steam propulsion, they still have auxiliary sails, and they still sustain, sustain damage on the basis of rough seas. Um, so it's something that we, we have to kind of keep an eye on. And we need to get some heavy uh, some repair parts for heavy ships in place also, which we, we decided to do. So we've got very little state revenue left. I think our operational costs are covered, though. Let me just double-check. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, operational costs are going to be covered. I think 18 for unit maintenance and 34, and that's our main kind of state state expenditure at the moment. So that's good. That's fine. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, economically, uh, no kind of disturbance in the economy for the time being. Very similar kind of levels of exports and domestic uh, consumption, yielding similar kinds of revenue. You know, around 200 for domestic market sales, around 150 for exports, which is good. You know, um, that's giving us kind of 350. A shade under um, private capital revenue per fortnight. Um, I think probably um, in late June we're going to look to begin the construction of an additional uh, rail system around Smyrna uh, to increase the production, the productive capacity of the factories that the industry we have located there and that's obviously going to happen also in Constantinople which will make a real difference when that railroad is finished at 300 days away and uh, 315 days away for the, the rail system in Adrianople. Um, so economically that's it. Let me just check through. Um, because Piedmont Sardinia declared war on Austria, uh, they are in a defensive alliance with kind of these uh, principalities, German kind of confederation principalities, uh, Baden, Bavaria, Saxony, and so on. And they've, they've kind of um, got involved and declared war on Sardinia. They've not declared war on us because we are a defensive power. We have not declared war on Austria. We've given them no cause or reason to declare war on us. So um, they, they won't sort of, they won't get involved in that war, thankfully. So it's just us against Austria for the time being. Fingers tightly crossed, really, that the, our northern neighbour um, doesn't decide to kind of get involved. And that would really complicate things. And it would be very tricky. I think on that, on that basis, we'd be fighting a very defensive campaign in the Balkans, keeping our forces tight and close in Adrianople. And we would obviously then have to re-release an army to the east, ultimately, uh, because we wouldn't want to start losing these fortresses. They would eventually start falling. So that's it for now. We're going to uh, put you on pause and uh, pass the turn. And um, yeah, see you. Uh, yeah, see you on the other side in uh, late June. Okay, welcome back. Then late June, turn has passed. And let's run through the term so we can see that. Uh, weather, weather has cleared now, um, and Omar Pasha is three days away from Adrianople. I think once he gets there, we've got him anyway to uh, go into the structure, um, maybe for a period of sort of recovery, I think. We might even be able to risk stretching his move now up to kind of Sofia. Let's see how much longer it would take him. 25 days now. So it's... Um, and that's not because of weather. I think it's just the general exhaustion of his force. So yeah, two days, uh, uh, or three days now, apparently. Um from Adrianople, we'll get him to enter the structure that gives him most of um, late June basically to recover uh, the organization and cohesion of his force. I think we're going to slip out one of the artillery forces just to reduce the command cost. There's a little bit of a penalty. Might even take both out actually. We can add those into another army. Um, so yeah, just, just remove the, the sort of command penalty. It's 4%, that's within the realms of acceptability, but it's nice to have his force kind of very tight and sort of um, well organized. Um, we'll, we'll stick out with Kareem Nadir once again onto Force March. Um, he's, he's not making bad headway, really. Sinop now to um, uh, Zongulak. And 17 days away if the Force March comes off from Adrianople. So we're doing good in terms of uh, beginning to get force concentration. Uh, the Army Corps in uh, Smyrna is still being trained and kind of constructed. And now the fleet conducted a sortie uh, into the Adriatic and then went back on itself. The purpose of this is just to screen um, uh, Osman Pasha basically with his reserve army corps as it moves up. And that seems to have come off. We'll look at the kind of detail of one of the engagements that the fleet actually um, had at the, in the Adriatic uh, with some Austrian transports. Um, so let's have a look at th through the battle reports then. Um, 
first battle then was Hussein Avenue with his cavalry division in Rhodes, still really trying to kind of uh, finish the job. These Creek rebels are turning out to be uh, much tougher uh, than anticipated. He does, I mean, you know, Hussein Avenue does only have a cavalry division, but his force is quite tired now. It's uh, suffered some losses and is out of supplies. To that end, uh, having finished the job in Saranaika, we're going to detach um, an infantry brigade, use some marine points, get that into Rhodes to try and just, you know, beef up our presence there a little bit and, and kind of wrap up that Greek rebellion. And on Saranaika, then, there were a couple of engagements that ultimately ended, uh, were three engagements in total, I think, that um, kind of whittled down and ultimately destroyed um, the remnants of uh, that rebellion. Um, and yeah, that seems to be a done deal now. That situation is kind of resolved. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, the fleet um, sorted towards the Gulf, the Gulf of Venice, really to the north, partly to give us a bit of intel um, on what forces we can see in this area, and just to try and maybe catch uh, any Austrian fleet by surprise. And we engaged some transports. These look to be kind of uh, fortress or garrison forces. 3,200 managed to sink them. They might have just been crossing over from the Polar Peninsula, possibly using some riverine uh, transport to get them to Verona. Uh, so I, I doubt they're going to be involved uh, or that they had anything to do with us. I may be wrong. But they might have more to do with the, uh, the conflict in northern Italy and nothing seems to have happened there. There's no kind of degree of military control, no intelligence reports with regard to any developments there. We're just really quick, checkly, checkly quick quickly check the foreign ministry um yeah they're still at war uh with piedmont sardinia no developments there okay um now the austrians have not sought to move south yet and exploit the zvornik gap that's good news for us the longer they leave that the better uh, we can still see some sort of um unit based uh in bihak or bihatch possibly i'm not sure how to pronounce that um a historically it has an Austro-Hungarian flag that might just denote that it's a uh, Honver, that it's that, that they are Hungarian forces um, and not sort of Germanic Austrian forces. Um, but in any case, we have some intelligence there, not very much, but uh, there's a, there's a, a regular force which has some artillery with it spotted there. Um, yeah, I mean, no no news is good news really in terms of sort of um, the rest of the Balkan Peninsula. That's good. It looks like these very small forces calculating they can secure Bosnia. And that that would be enough. And the idea is going to bring our forces up towards Zvornik and maybe kind of rather surprise them. Uh, when we uh, sort of lunge back into Bosnia, but we absolutely intend, if we can, to keep that territory and uh, uh, get the Austrians in a bit of a committed fight. Um, in terms of other strategic redeployments, I'm not sure if we have the... Yeah, we currently don't have the riverine points to move this infantry division from Palestine. Uh, riverine uh, points have been taken up, of course, with the division that's moving from Aden. Uh, it's one day away from uh, Jerusalem. We'll move out of the Samara as well. It's six days, and then obviously we're utilising some riverine points. So we're using we're using most of our civilian riverine kind of transport muscle, if you like, um, to move what we can at the moment, and can't access any more than that. Um, so yeah, okay. Sana's besieged. Uh, it looks like the supply issue is being resolved in Aden. That's excellent news. Um, no great um, detailed information. Um, is he activated? Yeah, he's activated. He doesn't have great supplies. Let's have a look. There's no, yeah, there's no detailed information on the character of these forces. We have on Hadramut, they have got a fairly sizable force, so it might be that they're keeping their main force back. They have two cavalry formations of some kind, I'd probably guess a brigade and a field artillery regiment. Incidentally, we have a field artillery regiment here. We actually captured this from the Yemenis, believe it or not. I, um, I forgot to mention this some months ago as well. We lifted the first siege of Sana just after the Crimean War. Ten days away. Um, I'll tell you what, let's sit tight just for now. Yeah, let's sit tight just for now. I want to get the uh, cavalry division fully reorganized and in, and in good shape and get our supply situation resolved before we kind of overextend that force uh, because we have just removed an entire infantry division. Um, no, actually, okay, so these forces actually represent an additional uprising. Great. So the main kind of um, Yemeni force, which we've been engaging, has fallen back. They're now, this is basically how they get kind of replacements. <laughs> it's uh, just unending rebellion. So yeah, an additional rebellion um in Taiz and, and Sana. These represent kind of new forces that are being brought into the field essentially from the local populace. Food for thought. 
Yeah, so um, uh, Mustafa is congratulated for his actions. Okay, that's uh, that's our naval commander. Good. And of course, as we already know, um, Osman is promotable. We'll look to maybe promote him once we get him back to Constantinople. Okay, let's have a look at some quick economic admin then before we pass the turn. Uh, make sure our economy is kind of well balanced. We want to make sure that we've got enough cereals and such to meet domestic demand. Um, still pushing for exports of manufactured goods. Uh, looks like textiles, textile exports have slackened off. Yeah, okay, it has. Yeah, I thought that because um, I was kind of eating very quickly into our textile kind of uh, stockpile. Uh, we've built up a really large kind of stockpile of coal again uh, to the point that we're going to start losing it, hemorrhaging it on the basis of um, basically just having too much of it in the economy. And it will start vanishing into the ether. Uh, so we'll look to export, get rid of some surplus coal for the time being. Okay, that looks all good. Let's ch uh, check our assets balance. Make sure that we have everything that we're meeting demand. Inflation sitting at two percent. Average satisfaction is ninety-two. Um, accumulated stock five four one one. Um, that's all good stuff. Nothing to complain about there. Let's just really quickly check. Um, actually, it's organic goods. Wages and yeah. So we're going to do that again. We're going to uh, turn off conversion for the time being. Um, Yeah, that's all fine. So the economy's in good shape. No major issues, no major concerns. Now, our chance to see a feature of the game. And you know what? <clears throat> I played this game since it came out. And I, I know so little about this feature of the game. Because in all of the games that I've played, uh, Pride of Nations, um, have experienced this so seldom. It's a really wonderful feature of the game. And I like the way that it's mapped and depicted. Um, but it's not really uh, explained or described very much in the manual. It's basically a card game. So there's a crisis between Britain and Prussia. And I kind of broadly get it, um, but despite having played the game for a decade, um, I, d I still don't fully understand quite how it works. Uh, so a crisis happens, it can be triggered. Uh, I mean, I get how it happens. It can be triggered for different reasons, overlapping claims, something like this. For example, if someone tries to colonize something and someone makes a stake on it. So, if I, so for example, if, um, if, for example... Qatar, you can see that Britain has 24 colonial penetration. Now, Qatar is already a protectorate, so we've already got a halfway house. It means that they can't do very much now. They can only try and prevent us from turning it into a formal colony by trying to um, cause our own colonial penetration to atrophy by uh, developing something themselves in, in, the, in the region. And that will constantly kind of make it difficult for us to convert it from a protectorate to a full colony. To make it to a full colony integrates that territory, its economy, its resources much more so into our, our, um, our own sort of national economy. Um, protectorate is, of course, I suppose you could say almost like a kind of semi, you know, self-administering colonial entity. But if it was not a protectorate and it was merely an influenced territory and I tried to convert that into a protectorate on the basis of 41% colonial penetration with Britain having... 24 they would be able to stake a claim um and it's like a, a very short-term lived event you put stake you draw it you can, you can put, draw the stake on on there and that can have different results now that that can um it can just stop outright our attempt to basically turn that into a protectorate um, it can fail the stake can fail and it becomes a protector anyway or it can serve as the catalyst for a crisis there are other things that can serve as catalyst for crises um uh it's not clear what exactly it was zanzibar they both have overlapping colonial penetration we have some colonial penetration there also that was kind of intentional um partly because we just wanted to sort of uh, see if we could get a little bit of an interested bit of a development we just sent some um merchants there unfortunately the prussians already have a trade post and a mission there um, but yeah, very low relations. Lots of things can kind of serve as a catalyst for a crisis. And a crisis happens, kind of classic 19th century. Things haven't changed too much. You can see with modern day events that a lot of these cards would be really, really relevant. You know, it's about kind of manipulating information. It's about kind of, you know, uh, it's like kind of um, a theatre that you do to the international stage to the for the other countries. And you have different kinds of things, different things. You have a prestige stash. That's how much prestige is being staked at the moment. On this crisis and that changes subject to the cards that you play uh, there is just cause indicator so it's one on behalf of the initiator 
uh, minus one on behalf of the target. Crisis intensity, obviously once it reaches 100, that's kind of it really, um, that it means war, it means the crisis, the crisis has be moved beyond the point where uh, there's any meaningful dialogue that can happen. And dominance. And the country with the highest prestige, I think, or the initiator, begins with kind of dominance. Um, and what happens is different countries, so Britain has played a card, great discourse, uh, Prussia has played a card, debate, and you can see that it, this influences the character, it influences things like the prestige stash, the, the intensity of the crisis. So if the crisis is getting to nearly 100 and you just basically want, you know, you're bluffing, uh, you can do something to maybe reduce crisis intensity and try and increase your attempt to control it, so on and so forth. There's different cards that you play, and this is this is how the crisis unfolds. Very analogous in some ways to events that we've lived through uh, over the past sort of months. You know, uh, issue an ultimatum, as you can imagine, this increases the crisis intensity significantly. Uh, it's also increased uh, the prestige stash. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's not, this is, I've never ever found a video on YouTube, I've never seen any forum or anything that really, really properly explains this, and despite having played the game for a good decade, in single player games, I've just come across this so seldom, that I've just kind of exercised judgment as best I can, I think I've usually won the crises, which means that I've, you know, like I've probably been doing it right, or at least I've come off relatively well, but I've never really experienced this very much, I've, um, yeah, anyway, issue ultimatum, uh, the British have issued an ultimatum, uh, the Prussians have issued a warning, again, you can see how this influences the crisis, um, I do really like this, even though I understand it poorly, uh, third card then, um, pressure supports, uh, take the world to witness, and you can see how the prestige stash is increasing, um, just cause indicator remains the same, um, so I think just cause being minus one um, means that uh, Prussia has kind of just cause. Internationally, they are recognized as being, for the time being, not completely, once they get to minus three, um, then the crisis ends because the world just recognizes that Prussia's right and Britain becomes isolated, okay? Um, yeah, crisis intensity sitting at 36. Um, it started at six. It's bumped up, presumably on the basis of Britain issuing an ultimatum, um, but it's sat at 36. Dominance uh, remains um, in the hands of the British. They have slight dominance. Um, they, they initiated the crisis. They're more powerful. They have more prestige. So they're still in a dominant position. Uh, second set of cards then, or uh, rather the fourth set of cards. Um, Britain calls for a conference. Uh, Prussia's looking to delay. Prestige stash uh, sits the same as it did before. It's slightly reduced from uh, the second round of diplomacy. Um... Uh, just cause, yeah, so just cause sits at one, so that's actually changed. Britain has acquired just cause on the basis of calling a press conference. Um, let's have a look. Changed minus, minus three control, change minus five, uh, the crisis control rating of your opponent. Okay, so based on this card algorithm, anyway, Britain has managed to get just cause. Internationally, now it's looking like the international, you know, uh, community, if you like, the concert of nations. Are looking more favorably towards Britain's kind of claim. So Britain is kind of winning this round of diplomacy. Crisis intensity has increased, but only very slightly, and uh, Britain remains in a dominant position. Uh, fifth round of diplomacy. Uh, Britain uh, moves for a diplomatic insult. Uh, Prussia, uh, mimicking the British from the previous round, calling a press conference. Prestige stash has increased. Um, just cause sits at one. Britain still has just cause. Intensity is 50, so the crisis intensity has suddenly ramped up, presumably on the basis of the insult, and um, Britain st retains dominance. Last round of diplomacy then, um, the prestige stash has now increased 1700. Um, crisis intensity, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, just cause remains at one, so Britain remains in a slightly favourable position. Broadly speaking, the international community now recognise their claim by the end of diplomacy and a slight decline then in um, crisis intensity down from 50 to 45 and dominance remains at one which is for the uh, initiator which is Britain they end in a dominant position that means that that prestige stash is divvied up reflecting things like just cause and dominance which means that for the most part Britain win this they get 11 um, 1100 prestige 
Prussia still gets some prestige. Uh, they don't lose. You can lose Britain. I mean, like, it can uh, go horribly wrong. Um, but for the most part, Britain has come out on top. Internationally, Britain is being recognised um, as, yeah, as the dominant power in this diplomatic crisis. And Prussia has had to kind of uh, walk away really with their tail between their legs that's very broadly how it works i can't describe much more beyond that anyone that's more familiar with this i play multiplayer pride of nations although i'm relatively new to that i've only been doing it for a few months really but even without i've just not come across this very much as a player um but how i'm describing it from what i gather is broadly how it functions and works and it's quite good because it's very realistic it's even though a card game makes it look quite cheesy and, and superficial i think the truth is the opposite it's a very very deep and kind of rich way of modeling um sort of diplomatic crisis it's kind of taking the world to witness character of kind of crises between great powers and how you manipulate information put pressure and try and win over the international community or in this period the concert of nations to your cause and britain has come out on top um and yeah get a lot of prestige from that so that's it, our first diplomatic crisis, not involving us, thankfully. At some point we may experience a diplomatic crisis, and I'll probably fumble it <laughs> and prove to you that I uh, understand this system very, very poorly. But from what I understand of it, it looks really, really good. I sort of get it, you know, but um, it's just something that doesn't feature very much. It's like anything, you only become good at it through kind of repetition, through you know familiarity with it, and it's just not something that lends itself well to that. Anyway, that's it. Economic admin is done. Um, our military moves remain unchanged for the time being. Um, it doesn't look like Austria is looking to exploit. Um, they've just taken Bosnia. It looks like they fancy just sitting tight there and have no intentions beyond that. So we are going to... Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's all of our moves, really. Uh, we're going to pass turn. Uh, I'll pop you back on pause. And um, yeah, see you in late June. Okay, welcome back then early July 1855 and uh, let's have a look at how the situation is developing it looks like uh, the Austrians are moving very cautiously they've moved into Zvornik we don't know the size the composition the character of the forces they have but we have two light cavalry brigades in Sofia and um, Salonika we're going to move these guys forward now it's three days and seven days we're going to have them set to attack but faint probe attack the purpose of these force is to function as a kind of reconnaissance to try and give us some information. It might be that the, the Austrians sit back and stay in Zvornik. It might be they push into Nice or Kosovo or something like this. But we're going to faint probe and start trying to get some kind of uh, intelligence on uh, the nature of Austrian forces. Um, Omar Pasha then in Adrianople. He, uh, he also had a, a good period of rest, which is uh, good to see. The force, uh, most of his force anyway, has largely recovered. It's in pretty good shape. Uh, we're going to detach then. Let's have a look. One artillery brigade. What does that give him? Two percent. Yeah, we'll have. Uh, we'll keep one artillery, in, one independent artillery regiment rather, um, in his force for the time being. He's activated. Uh, what we are going to do now is we're going to move him forward. It's going to take 14 days. We're going to set him to attack posture, all-out attack. If anything makes a move to try and besiege Sophia, that's going to be countered uh, relatively quickly. Uh, what we're going to do is also to begin to order his forces into a kind of combat posture. So let's begin to kind of attribute commands um, to different army corps. Okay. And, yeah, that's done. So, uh, yeah, four, oh, 12, so that's reduced his march time down, down to 12 days, which is excellent news. And uh, from there, of course, he'll then be looking to move up towards Zornik. Uh, but, yeah, that's good news. Abdelkrim Nadir, not too far behind. 11 days now um, until he gets into... Um, Adrianople, I think once he's there, we'll, uh, we'll kind of attach that artillery um, regiment uh, to his force. And what we're also going to do now, I think, is let's have a look. Okay, let's break this force apart. Uh, incidentally, you can see that the situation is wrapped up now, very much so, um, in um, roads. Um, we're going to use riverine points for Hussein Avni. And we're going to move his cavalry division. He captured an artillery regiment also. And we're going to move his force um, to 16 days. Bit of a shame. But we're going to move his force um, to Adrianople. And um, we'll give him command of Abdul Karim's force. But yeah, good stuff. Um, Osman then, with the Reserve Army Corps, has landed. His force uh, is back from the Venezuelan adventure. Good job. Um, in the bag. We're going to hook that force up then. And... Um, 
to Rita Pasha's kind of main reserve force, and we're also going to detach Kershid Pasha, and we'll go uh, to promote him, I think. Yeah, we'll do that. Kershid Pasha. Osman Pasha, what am I talking about? Who's Kershid Pasha? Never even heard of the guy. Um, yeah, that's good. And we've got an additional army corps, of course, being constructed, um, and that's that's still happening. Uh, we've got, uh, okay, we've got, and we've got a cavalry division to add to that force also. In fact, come to think of it, I want to get that, that force in Constantinople, don't I? Um, yeah, that's good, okay. Okay, we're out of riverine points now to move these divisions. What I'm going to do, I think, is we've now got our transport fleet back in position. Uh, we'll reattach the riverine transport uh, to the heavy lift transport fleet. We're going to have to keep them in Constantinople just for maybe another fortnight just to get the uh, um, this force kind of recovered. It's just come at the end of a long journey from northern Venezuela. It's running low on supplies and this sort of thing, and its, uh, it's crew are likely exhausted and so on. So we'll have to give um, that force a little bit of time to reorganize itself in Constantinople. And then we'll send that force, and uh, that force will be able to pick up both of those divisions and bring it uh, bring it to sort of what, back to Constantinople, basically. And that, both of those divisions will be folded into the reserve army that we are building up in, um, in Constantinople. Again, I currently like the command of Rita Pasha. Uh, Abu Karim will be detached, of course, as mentioned in a previous video, and be given command of that force. And we'll give Rita Pasha command of the Constantinople garrison. That's it. In terms of our developments, that is it. Have we got enough riverine points yet? We have. We'll move this um, infantry brigade then. Uh, we'll move that to Benghazi. Yeah, and I think that's it um, for military matters. Um, yeah, so let's have a look. It doesn't actually say that uh, that force was completely destroyed, um, but it was an artillery uh, b uh, battalion, full artillery battalion, and it was captured. So uh, we know that force is destroyed because we captured the artillery battalion. So that's good news. That's the end of the kind of Greek and Saranigan revolts which is kind of good news. Um, but yeah, the war has started off surprisingly slowly. Um, it's not as, you know, um, not quite as kind of lively as the beginning of the Russian war. The Austrians, you know, uh, I'm guessing, um, yeah, the Russians are still at war with Sweden. Yeah, the Austrians, I'm, I'm guessing, just thought they'd take sort of Bosnia and that would be fine. That would be it sort of thing, you know, uh, not much else to kind of, um, not much else required after that. But uh, yeah, they were wrong. Um, okay, the economy's in a position now. We've got 1,500 plus 100 manufactured goods, 84 steel. We've got a nice amount of state revenue. The economy's starting to look in decent shape. And we've now got some resources that we can kind of put into play. Uh, so we're going to begin the construction of a railroad. Um, yeah, integrated railroad system around Smyrna. And uh, that's going to take 360 days. It costs a little bit more than advertised because this is quite a hilly country. Um, but yeah, that's really, really good. Nothing else to construct or build there. Let's have a look at some. Let's have a look at our economic reports very quickly. Let's just check anything else here. So five manufactured goods, tobacco is consistent to the UK, uh, dyes, fruits, fish, cereals. So still mostly agricultural exports. Exports down to 130 this time round, um, but domestic market sales slightly up at 200. And um, yeah, no major concerns or issues there. I think we're going to start pushing for some steel imports again, just just to top up. Um, there we go. We'll just go with whatever the easiest imports are. Inflation's increased 3%. That is interesting. Let's have a look at the reason for that. Mm -hmm. um, that may be just on the basis of conversion. Uh, we did have quite a lot of uh, diamonds built up. France has decreed partial mobilization. That's interesting. I wonder if they're going to get wrapped up in the Italian affair. I know that, they, for example, they just declared war on Parma, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know what their intentions are. Let's have a look at French relations really quickly. I don't want to become too distracted from the inflation issue. I want to keep an eye on that. Um, they have a trade deal with us. Also, Siam. That's interesting. Yeah, they're at war with Parma, but that's it. Their relations appear on Sardinia. Relatively good, though. Keep an eye on that and track those developments. But um, let's see if we can see anything on why inflation increased. It may just be a natural increase on the basis of conversion. Um,
yeah, there's no specific reason. Our capitalists weren't compelled to borrow money or anything like that, as far as I can see. So it would just be on the on the basis of the fact that we had um, we did have seven or eight ge gems built up. Uh, so it may just be that. Um, the sort of economic admin out, but three percent is nothing too much to worry about. It's it's also temporary, but uh, two was better, obviously. Um, let's get our economic admin squared away. That looks all decent enough. Yeah, I think it would have been due, due to diamond conversion. I've stopped conversion of uh, agricultural goods into can into preserved foods for the time being, simply because. Um, yeah, we, we just had so much canned goods, it was just kind of vanishing. It was uh, on the basis of wastages and corruption. Um, one national market sales, one conversion. We'll leave that as it is, I think. Uh, gems. Um, actually, we'll put up to 30% so we get slightly more national market sales. We'll still look for conversion, but we'll be looked to convert a third of gems instead of kind of half uh, from the time from now on, basically. Um, so it will always um, it will it will sort of suppress this issue of corruption. Is the only thing that it could come from, I think, is long term conversion of diamonds into state revenue. So we're going to kind of um, ensure that basically two thirds of our diamonds now will be uh, put into the into private hands as opposed to state revenue. Um, that will kind of that should sort of mitigate that issue. But yeah, we still have five, for example, in our national stockpile. Um, so got to be a little bit careful there. Keep a careful eye on that. I think it might have got to eight or nine or something like that. Um, yeah, okay, um, that's fine. Uh, not activated, our stuff is not activated. His supply issue is, is sorted, however, and yeah, his force seems to be in good shape, but he's not activated, so we'll keep him outside the fortress of Aiden. He's got a good combat factor there. We've got better intelligence now on the Yemeni column at Taiz, it's yeah, not small, and they are still besieging. Of course, I forgot this has a depot, so the depot at Sana does generate a kind of um, a, a sort of generic. I suppose this represents the workers at the depot, the military force at the depot that are arming themselves to defend uh, that site. But um, that's it. Economic admin squared away. Let's just check our assets balance, make sure everything's okay. Yeah, everything's fine. Just inflation is the only kind of um, only curious thing there, but we'll keep an eye on that and. Um, yeah, so recon force is moving into position then, uh, just southeast of Zvornik. Omar Pasha's main field command moving up, uh, set to an assault, uh, an offensive posture if he's engaged, and he'll be at Sofia in 12 days. And Abdul Karim Nadir's army uh, will be in, uh, yeah, will be in Adrianople in 11 days. So we, we're starting to get good force concentration. So far, no Russian declaration of war. Looks like the gamble's paid off. Uh, still forces in Poti, still a large field command um, in um, Tbilisi, I think. Um, yeah, or Tiflis. But yeah, uh, that's fine. I'll pop you on pause. We'll pass turn and uh, we'll see what situation we are in come early August. See you on the other side. Okay, welcome back then. Late July. 1855 and we're starting to see the opening play uh, by Austria a couple of well a handful of small engagements really only one against Austria and that was this one here in Nish I believe uh, which was our reconnaissance force engaging pretty much the same kind of Austrian force so the first blood of the war was drawn a light cavalry uh, Regiment and or two uh, light cavalry brigade engaging uh, a mirror opposite a reconnaissance force. The Austrians came off better. We suffered 900 losses. They suffered 300, and that is the first engagement of the war. Obviously, it's a very small kind of skirmish, reconnaissance skirmish. Our boys are going to fall back uh, north towards Agosta, recover, and reorganize themselves. But yeah, they they collided with um, an Austrian force in Niche in the south. Um, our cavalry uh, reconnaissance force came into contact with a revolt in uh, Macedonia um, initially we inflicted a thousand casualties took a hundred casualties of our own um, but uh, this has continued into further engagements 
which means that our southern reconnaissance force never made it north towards Kosovo, and there is an Austrian force in Kosovo, and we can reconnaissance the nature of that force. It's fairly large. There doesn't seem to be a kind of field commander, but it's comprised of lots of different kinds of brigades, very mixed forces, but they have some real big guns in there. They've got, uh, let's have a look, 5th uh, Mattresson Corps, uh, Landstrom Infantry Brigade, and an additional two Army Corps, so three core size forces there, um, at least, plus a, mix, a mixture of kind of different brigades. So that, that's, that's a would say, an army size force of... 70 to 90,000 men that has pushed through this Zvornik Gap. We don't know who their commander is. It's patchy information and heading south, probably towards Salonika, if I had to guess. Uh, Omar Pasha is uh, in Sofia. His force is a little bit disorganized for the march. We're going to keep him set to an um, offensive posture uh, for the time being uh, so that he engages anything that moves in towards Sofia. This will provide him also, despite being in that posture, this will allow him a measure of recovery if he's not engaged if the Austrian move is to move down towards Salonika I mean at, on an activated basis in the summer he's what 13 days from Salonika um, I wonder if he can get there any quicker 17 days by that route yeah so by the fastest by, by the fastest I mean it's always going to uh, give us the fastest route anyway I don't know why I bothered doing that I was just curious whether we could do it in 14 days or something um, Abdul Karim Nadir is also activated, but his force is quite disheveled and disorganised. It takes him 12 days. So on the basis of a you know a summer move, two activated generals, decent weather, we could uh, get into Salonika very quickly indeed. Salonika is a victory location, of course. There's a chance this force might move south and try and assault Salonika straight away, but I don't want to be too risky. I'm a little bit uh, cautious early on. We're still in the process of getting force concentration. We have got one of our, our main forces forward now. It's a little bit disorganized for the march. And uh, Abdul Karim Adir, of course, has not even been in, in um, Adrianople very long. In fact, I'm even going to take the rash measure of uh, depositing Abdul Karim Adir in to uh, the fortress just to speed up his recovery and, and reorganization. Um, now, in Constantinople itself, then uh, we promoted Osman Pasha. Uh, we Also, uh, Selim Pasha spawned because promoting Osman uh, relieved a slot for a, a, a lieutenant general. So we have a lieutenant general, which we've, we've slotted into that command, currently under command of Ruta Pasha. We have the Reserve Army Corps, which is under the command of Osman, plus what we had before. And we also have Hussein Avni's force about to make landing. I'm thinking we give the command to Hussein Avni, actually. And we'll keep Abu Karim Adir in, in command of the force that he has. So Hussein uh, Avni will control essentially the third army. Uh, he's moving into place with an, a cavalry division in Constantinople, plus an artillery regiment, which we managed to kind of nick from Greek rebels. Someone had provided them with guns, and we capture those guns, and we will make them our own. And of course, the additional uh, army corps, which is being built in Smyrna is looking like it's almost there now last sort of stages of fabrication just getting the guns in place for the artillery regiments that are kind of uh, an integral part of that army corps um let's have a quick look i would suggest that the uh, the transport fleet's in good enough shape now so we're going to move the transport fleet uh off the coast 18 days that's a shame that's going to take that long um bit of a surprise especially given the weather's not too bad but okay fine uh so 18 days for the transport fleet to make um to arrive off the coast of Palestine um, and we're going to also conduct a sortie using the main fleet to provide some cover no we are not going to do that <laughs> okay uh, we'll set the main fleet then I should have done that so the main fleet is in Constantinople yeah the main fleet requires some time to uh, to reorganize the transport fleet is set to evade combat and, and um, I don't think that'll be too much of a problem I think we'll probably once we get the transport fleet here we we'll actually get the transport fleet into the port at Samara for the time being. Allow that some further time to reorganize and then we'll sortie the main fleet to provide a screen so that we can transport those troops back. We don't want to kind of lose two divisions. Um, so one of the infantry brigades then from Rhodes is uh, one day away from making a landing at Benghazi. That's fine. So we'll have two divisions bolstering that third army that's being built. We'll have two army corps, two infantry divisions, a cavalry division and um, uh, three yeah, three kind of regiments of guns, uh, of artillery. So that's good. That'll be, that'll be three armies. So we're still in the kind of force concentration phase a little bit. Opening moves are made. We've got the spear tip ready with uh, Omar Pasha in Sofia. 
and we're almost at the point now where we're getting a third army assembled and we've got a second army in place at Adrianople. We're going to utilize the next fortnight to get that army um, in as best a kind of condition as possible and we'll see what the kind of the Austrian opening play is. We're going to keep this cavalry division uh, this cavalry division, this cavalry brigade in place for the time being, set to retreat if engaged, and just use that really to try and get as much intelligence as we possibly can on the Austrian forces that are working their way through. Now, we, we spotted some Austrian merchants in um, the trade box in the Mediterranean. I think it's probably time now to bring our raiding fleet into play. So we're going to do that. And we'll sit them in the trade box and see, see if we can kind of um, interdict and engage any kind of um, Austrian trade shipping in the Mediterranean. For an opening move, um, uh, it, it's a slow start to this war, isn't it? Much slower than the Russian war. You know, in terms of how that bodes, we don't know. That said, the Austrians are now sending larger forces through, albeit it, it appears to be in a somewhat clumsy fashion. Um, but it looks like the Austrians are now, they have some forces um, in Milan, uh, possibly besieging the city. Um Keep an eye on that situation. Is it Milan or is that uh, Alessandria? No, I beg your pardon. Milan, what do you control Milan? Sorry, um, Alessandria. Um, I think Alessandria, no, Torino, I think, is the capital of Piedmont, Sardinia. And it looks like the Austrians have a revolt at Friuli, which is interesting. Uh, so they've lost the towns of Friuli and the, and the port uh, to some uh, Italian radicals, uh, by the looks of it. We'll keep an eye on that situation and how that may benefit us, of course. That will, that will serve as an interesting distraction, as well as the Italian theatre more generally um, for Austrian troops. But yeah, the Austrians are making a play now. We don't know who their commander is on the surface of it. That looks rather disorganised. A bit of a messy, clumsy kind of a configuration. But that, you know, that remains to be seen. There may be different forces that are just kind of crossing paths in that area. There may be commanders there with, that we just cannot see. Um, so we'll see how that situation plays out. But it looks like we do now have a large Austrian force making its way into the Balkans or our part of the Balkans. Now there's a large revolt in the kind of southern Caucasus uh, that the Russians are experiencing. It's even taken one of their depots. That's very good news for us indeed. And that will serve, hopefully, to kind of draw any Russian attention away from our frontier and forestall any plans that they may have had uh, with regard to them moving against us. But, um, yeah, interesting kind of opening sort of month and a half so far. Um, no major engagements, just reconnaissance engagements. I suspect that in the next fortnight we will be looking at a fairly significant engagement. Probably the next fortnight to the next month, we'll be looking at the first pitched battle of the war, I suspect. But we're going to play it a little bit cautious. We want to make sure that when we attack, we're in the best possible uh, position. And we want to be obviously looking to hurl the Austrians back, either through the Zornic Gap or even closing the gap off entirely, using other forces, wheel them into place, and see if we can destroy any Austrian forces uh, that make their way, perhaps a little bit overconfidently, into our uh, part of the Balkans through that very narrow gap. So we'll keep an eye on the situation. I think, um, let's have a look. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll do some um, some economic admin, make sure that everything is kind of set for uh, next turn. Um, I'll end the recording here in past turn, so the next recording will pick up then in early August, and we'll see what's happened over the next fortnight. I'm not going to be making any significant military moves, I think, for the next fortnight. The next turn, we're going to sit tight and... See how the Austrian offensive kind of develops, how it unfolds, what its target is. You know, I don't want to kind of run around like a kind of flapping hen, uh, moving my army south, exhausting them in endless marches across rivers, even though the weather's quite good, uh, because it means that, you know, for all we know, the Austrians are going to make a play for Sofia. We don't know. Uh, we'll, keep our, we'll keep our main army in Sofia, and once Abdul Karim the Deer is in a strong enough position with the second army, we'll move him towards um, Salonika. If the Austrians do make a really big play for Salonika, we've got two armies then that we can bring to bear on them. You know, that's going to be like 150, 160,000 men. And I suspect that would be more than enough um, to kind of seal the deal there against the Austrians. But that remains to be seen. So, I'll end the recording here. And um, yeah, we'll pick up back in um, early August 1855. So, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.